you ready for the Word of God? Because I feel like I have a little challenge for you today. I feel like I have a filet mignon for you. I don't know if you... Did you bring your steak knife? Um, I hope you have your steak knife with you, and that's your Word. Amen? I'll open up your Word and turn with me to Acts chapter 6. You know, I have been talking in this sermon series about change lives, change lives, and I want to continue it today. Um, last week, I had uh, Pastor Jim uh, come on up and uh, interject that uh, with, with a message too, and it was perfect. Everything that he preached about too is just aligning perfectly with where we're going. If you remember, change lives, change lives. If we look at the book of Acts, how God transformed the lives in the book of Acts, And how those lives then stepped out. Just think about Peter, how he stood up on the day of Pentecost. That was totally not Peter, right? That was totally unlike him. And all of a sudden, full with the Holy Spirit, he stands up and preaches a message. 3,000 people come to believe. Uh, People were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all mass exodus down to the River Jordan. We're all baptized mass Baptism, they probably used up every pool there was in Jerusalem. They had a couple of pools, right? And it was like, yep, we, all the pools are ours right now. We have a mass baptism. 3,000 people were baptized. Uh, that day, it says, that afternoon, incredible. And so they all come back, and they have the first healing and miracle. And then the church uh, is being told that they have to remain quiet. And so all the believers, they are praying and, uh, but they're praying, Lord, we just saw what you can do. You can do healing and miracle. Would you do more of that? And all of a sudden, a couple of verses later, we read that it was like on a daily basis, healings and miracles. And when you look in between from prayer to fulfillment, what happened in between, two things happened in between. The one was people living together in unity. Remember that sermon? Uh, believers had everything in common. And the other one was the story, the hard story with Ananias and Sapphira. The fear of the Lord. And we we talked about that a little bit. And so the the consequence of all this was that um, it says in in chapter 5, verse 12, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. Amen. Amen. You know, Jan and I, we we were talking. It's like, don't you think that we have nowadays, it's like, what's what's wrong with Christianity in general, with, with churches in general? Uh, that you don't see healings and miracles and signs and wonders like the early church saw. You know, so, uh, other denominations, they, 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 they believe that, oh, that was only for the early church because God wanted to do something in a very special way in the beginning in order to spread Christianity. So he had to fill them with the Holy Spirit. He had to give them the charismata, the, the, the gifts, the, the spiritual gifts, but that was only for 2,000 years ago so that we can enjoy a good time today. But it's not the case. You know, uh, America has gone through a time of the Great Awakening. Amen. It was great awakening. I feel like we're in front of a new great awakening. We need to have a new great awakening where all of the believers just literally wake up and like, man, we live in a broken society. We have people. Just this morning, I was reading an article about how they... Uh, at the university somewhere, was it a college or something, they want to bring in a Satanist group to just uh, advertise Satanism within. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I don't know where we're going to, where society is heading to, but more than ever, the Holy Spirit wants to work and wants to be active in our lives and through our lives to so spread that light. The darker the darkness gets, the brighter the light shines. Amen. And God wants to pour His new, He wants to anoint us with a, we talked about, we, we sang this morning about new wine. He wants to fill us with a new spirit. I feel awake this morning. Hallelujah. Actually, Gene warned me already. Pastor, you cannot have coffee this morning. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the post from my wife. Uh, it was about coffee, how coffee was introduced, and then three years to Europe, and then three years later, how Martin Luther, <laughs> the coffee the pastor, brought Reformation, right? <laughs> I feel awake this morning, but I, I know it's not the coffee. I know it's the Holy Spirit. He wants to speak to us today. And 
So last, last week, Jim talked about how when we, we need to get our lives to a place. Uh, we waste our time, we waste our talent, we're afraid of our talents, and we hold back with the treasures that God has given us. And it's like this is a, a, a crucial point because we cannot get from praying, Lord, save my family, heal those people, heal me, he, save this and that person to actually seeing all this fulfilled and walking in it if we don't do these things in between. And one of those things in between is literally to let go, literally to surrender to God, to come to God and bring our lives as a living sacrifice. Do you know what happens with the sacrifice? He dies. <laughs> Ouch. What does it mean to die to ourselves daily? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It talks about this death, pick up your cross and follow me. Did you ever notice that Jesus never said, pick up the cross and I will follow you? <laughs> he says, you follow me. Wherever I go, that you may be also. There is something where we are supposed to follow Christ. Where we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We are the aroma of Christ, right? So today, as we're talking, I just moved forward and I, I came to... An odd story. I, I came to, to believers, two believers that were actually um, elected in to, for just an ordinary work, but then how the, those, those believers were, were used by God was a really mighty way. And I just, um, the whole story starts in, in Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, the church starts very usual with. In front of every church development, there lies a problem, usually pushed by a complaint. <laughs> Did you ever notice that? I do. In Acts chapter 6, it says, Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because of the widows that have been neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and they said, It is not right uh, that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among yourselves seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, and we will appoint them to this duty. I don't know how much you know about the background, but like, wh why was there a grumbling? Why was there a dispute, a complaint arising between the Hellenists and the Jews? Who were the Hellenists? I don't know if you remember that. Um, the Jews were literally the, the, the Jews that went into exile and came back. They have, they have not intermarried. They have kept themselves pure. And they come back. And so those are the Jews in Jerusalem, right? They live in Jerusalem. Now the Hellenists, those are, are the Jews of the diaspora, of the uh, dispersion, literally when they were scattered. So when the Babylonians came, when the Assyrian army came a little bit earlier, uh, they scattered them all. So all of them, they were scattered. And what do you do when you're scattered, when you're hopeless, when your identity is robbed? You adapt, right? And that's what happened with a lot of those Hellenists. The Hellenists, because they adapted the Hellenistic language. The Jews talked Hebrew, and the Hellenists, they talked, their language was Greek, right? And so you have the Hellenists, you have the story in, in Samaria where, where the Jews uh, don't like to go through Samaria. Jesus was talking with, uh, with, in the village with a, uh, a woman at the well in Samaria, and she's, he's talking about dogs. Well, it's not right uh, to have those food given to dogs, but Jesus didn't mean that the woman is a dog, right? Actually, in, in that culture back then, dogs was referred to everybody who lived outside of the covenant. Everybody who's outside of the covenant was considered like dog. And so it was like this cultural thing. Um, and so when Jesus was saying that, but those Hellenists and those people living in Samaria, they were worshiping on, on different hills. They were not worshiping in Jerusalem. There was this great divide between the two. Now, when the church came to get in unity again, and uh, everybody was just living together and sharing resources, um, they, everybody had widows and people in need. And what, one of the things that they saw is that the widows of the Hellenists, so there was a cultural divide already, but now when it comes to the food distribution, which was going on on a daily basis, uh, those Hellenistic widows, they, they were neglected. And so they complained, 
came up and they knocked at the door of the main church in Jerusalem and said, it is not right. You know, it's, uh, uh, our widows are being neglected. You take care of your own, but you're not really caring about us. And so the church had to adapt to this problem. And let me ask you this. Was this an ordinary problem, a natural problem, or a spiritual problem, or an extraordinary problem? It was a very natural one, right? Wouldn't you say I mean, neglecting the widows, that they're not getting their daily distribution of, of food and resources, what, that's a very natural problem. But then, here is the solution. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, a good reputation, full, like filled, not just sprinkled, not just knowing something about the Holy Spirit, but being full. Just imagine those, being full with the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, and we will appoint them to this duty. So the apostles, they had an ordinary problem, but they picked extraordinary people to cover that problem. Do you realize that? God could pick ordinary people that are not filled with the Holy Spirit for ordinary problems. But God doesn't do that. When it comes to ministry and when it comes to being in service of the Lord, even the supplying of ordinary problems is, is supplied by extra or by people filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is key. We cannot step out. We cannot do if we think, you know, all, all that we do is just a very simple and very ordinary ministry and we just go out, maybe on, uh, we're going to hand out pies here very soon. We go out and hand out pies from door to door and it's just a very a normal thing. We, we, we just want to help people get some food, right? So we knock at the door. If nobody opens, we just drop it there at the footstep and we walk away. And if somebody opens with tears in their eyes, like, hey, I hope this fills your need. God bless. And we walk away again. It's not that way. God fills us with the Holy Spirit for a reason. Because He wants us to be the light in darkness. He wants us to be the aroma of Christ. To bring the love of Christ. And that comes with something. That comes. That's, that is the kingdom of God. Now what is the kingdom of God? It does not consist in talk. But in power. Right? When God does something, even when it's only ordinary things, God wants to supply it with the extraordinary people, and that's you and I. God wants to fill us with His Spirit. He wants to fill us to overflow with His Spirit so that when we are faced with ordinary things, automatically the supernatural comes with it. The aroma of Christ comes with it. That God can make His appeal through us. Amen? That is huge. You know, when you're at your workplace, when you're at school, when, when, uh, when you talk with schoolmates, nothing in your life when you're a Christian, when you're a believer, is ever only ordinary work. Because it is no longer I who live for myself. It is Jesus Christ himself who wants to live through me, who wants to live through you, through us. Do, do we understand this this morning? Jesus Christ himself wants to use your eyes. He wants to come through your mouth. He wants to come touch people through your hands, through the words that come out of your mouth. He wants to pierce the darkness through the words that come out of your mouth. He wants to use your feet. Everything about he wants to live through us. Jesus Christ alive through us. We are just an empty shell, but not empty. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's Christ who lives through us, and we provide the vessel for God. Amen? Do you remember the, the, the illustration that I hear, had here once on stage with the remote control? <laughs> Willless, basically. No, I'm not going to go there. No, I don't want to do this. We are not supposed to be this way. God, if he says go, we go. If he says to the left, we turn to the left. If he says to the right, we go to the right. Why, Why is that? That when God 
uses, wants to use us, he doesn't just want to supply natural needs with natural means. He wants to do it with supernatural means. You know, in, in, verse, in chapter 5, uh, the last verse here in, in 42, it says, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ, it's a, it's a weird wording it, that the Christ is Jesus. He doesn't say that Jesus Christ is Lord. He says that the Christ. Now, what is the Christ? What is the meaning of the Christ? In Greek, it's Christos. It is the anointed one. Christ means the anointed one. Christ is the anointed one. Now, when we are Christians, what does that make us? Do you ever wonder about that? We are the anointed ones. We're not just leaning back and enjoying life. There is an, when we step into the service of God, we, we, can, we can adore God from afar and just know something about God, but even other religions believe in God. Even demons believe in God, but they cannot confess the Lord as Lord. There is something about standing in the Lord's service, coming with the glory of God, coming with the power of God that makes our life live under the anointing of God. Under the anointing of God. And I, do you remember when, when Jim preached here last year, he, uh, last week, he, he talked about, he took us back to Isaiah chapter 61. I used that reference too on um, on Encounter Weekend, because it talks about this anointing. Let, let's go there again. And when, he, when he, he read this over, if you remember, he read it over us as a proclamation for, uh, toward us. And I don't know if you caught that, but that is so important. Let's, let's go over it again. Isaiah chapter 61. There is the purpose for the anointing. We have, you know, we are anointed for a purpose and that God anointed Christ for a purpose. Anointing is never just to feel good. <laughs> the anointing of God is not to have this warm, cozy feeling on us, but the anointing of God on our lives has a very specific purpose. Go ahead and, and let, let's read this. For, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. It's like this mantle, this anointing that comes on me, but you will be clothed with the power from and it is upon us because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. Actually, poor is a, is, is a bad translation. It says to the afflicted, it, to bring good news to the afflicted people. There's a lot of afflicted people out there in Hutchinson that need good news, that there is good news for them. Who is preaching them the good news? Who is bringing them the good news? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, the, th the people that are broken, broken lives, broken family relationships, broken marriages. God wants to bind up to fix, God is in the business of fixing lives up. And he wants to have this anointing on us. This talks about Jesus Christ, that he has sent him to, to bind up the brokenhearted. But remember what all of this prophecy of Isaiah was, that the anointed one will come to restore Israel to its purpose. Because it was the purpose of Israel to have the anointing of God on Israel in order to be a blessing to all the nations, to the entire world, to be a blessing to the entire world. That blessing and that purpose has gone over to the churches, right? That, that rests on us. God wanted, and so he's sending the messianic servant. He sends his son, Jesus Christ, uh, as the anointed one to restore the anointed one, to restore Israel, to restore the church, to come and to step into the purpose that God has for them. Now, and this actually is, is Jesus Christ is the anointed one restoring us to be the anointed ones for the ministry. He, he, keep hearing this. He sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim. This is words that come. Proclamation is, is something spoken with a mouth. Amen. It's something spoken over somebody else. To proclaim, to speak out liberty, to speak out freedom to the captives. There are so many people out there that are captives and they don't even know it. To speak freedom 
to the captives and the opening of the prison. This is not jailbreaks. <laughs> the, the anointed ones, they're not going out and actually breaking over, they're busting, kicking over the, uh, kicking open the jails. It is through the pronunciation. How did God create the world? He spoke and it came to be. There is power in the word of God, but that's just spoken out. That's why when, when, when I came up with the valleys for a church, I put a term behind what I saw, what God was doing. Speak life. If you want to speak life, it's the one way that God has us join in what he is doing. God is at work all around us, and the one way that he wants us to join him is by using our mouth, by speaking life over things, not condemnation, not doubt, not little faith, but to speak life over things. And here it says, to proclaim, to speak out freedom, and to speak out opening of prisons, prison doors. <laughs> there is a lot of people in bondage that need to hear the, the opening of prison doors spoken over them. And then it says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There, God, there is a grace period. We can still get saved. The time is not over yet. But there will be the day of the vengeance of the Lord too. And to proclaim this too, we proclaim both. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. If you don't repent, you will go to hell. <laughs> God is not the teddy bear in heaven who is just, you know, because God is all loving. God is loving, but he is not weak. You know, God is a holy God. God is a, a God who does not share his glory with anyone or anything. And there is the kingdom of God. We, we are in this, in this business of proclaiming this. This is why the anointing is resting on us to speak freedom, to speak that there is a grace period and the people have to repent to grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them beautiful headdresses instead of ashes, instead of depression, instead of... Things are broken down. He wants us to give them beautiful headdresses. There should be the oil of gladness when it comes out of our mouth. There should come joy with what we're doing. Oil of gladness instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. <laughs> Praises instead of a faint spirit. Are you sitting at the workplace or in school and you have a faint spirit? Oh, everything is bad. Nothing is really working out. I don't know why this happened. Where is this garment of the oil of gladness and the garment of praise that proclaims Jesus Christ, that he is in charge no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens around me, Jesus Christ is in charge. And now listen, all of a sudden the language changes here. It says, that day, there is the purpose again, so that those people, right, we have the anointing so that those people, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the firm, firm with deep roots going down deep, oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he, <laughs> that he may be glorified. Every, the anointing of God resting on our life, it always has the same aim. It points to God. It gives glory to God and to nobody else. They... They shall build up the ancient ruins. Listen to this. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. The stuff that Satan has destroyed in our own life, the stuff, the old ruins, the broken down cities for generations past that they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Hallelujah, look into your life and see what a heyday sometimes the enemy had through your ancestors, how he bound people through alcohol or through sexual abuse, whatever, like devastations. When you look in your own family tree and family line, the stuff that the enemy was just coming in and trying to devastate, to to burn to ashes, to smash down the fortresses of God. And he left those places devastated. There is an anointing on Jesus trying to anoint us, our lives, so that through our ministry, through what we, what we do, the proclamation that comes out of our mouth, all of a sudden everything that Satan has destroyed in generations is being built up again. There is healing coming out of the ministry. Amen? The Lord wants to do this. <laughs> the next one I claim. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Even when they speak with the Austrian accent. Foreigners, 
that they should be your plowmen and vine dressers. The next one is for you here. I give you this one. Verse 6 where it says, But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of God. Wow. <laughs> I bet you did not expect the coming in here today. They shall speak of you as the ministers of God. You remember the picture of, of the tabernacle, the picture of, of, of the temple with the priests? The priests transitioning forth and back between the presence of God, washing their hands, and coming back to the people that come with their burdens, that come with their concerns, they come with their depression, they come with worries about life, they come with their bondages of sins and coming to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been the sacrifice. He, the, 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 way, the way is paved. Everything is clean. We are being the ministers of Jesus Christ, the Roma, the ambassadors for Christ, the Roma of Christ. We are ministering Christ. There is this anointing on us. And where we go out and serve them, Finally, you have come. I have prayed for you for so long that the Lord would shake you up in your tent outside of the tabernacle that you would finally realize that the, that the sacrifice has been paid. You can come in. Finally, you're here. Let me take you. You know what I, what I love about in, in the Catholic Church, there is the confessional. I don't know if you know it from, from early church history, but one of the things that and that the priests did, when a sinner used to come into the church uh, before the, the confession was uh, instituted, the sinner would come and the priest would go and, and take the sinner and he would prostrate himself before the Lord, laying flat, like in the sanctuary, just laying flat, helping the sinner, ministering to the sinner that he can come in. How many times? How many times did people come here to church during the week and they were broken? Crashing down here at the altar when, when it's like, where's the light switch? You know, we have to find for that person the light switch. And switching on the lights and the person comes here and it just breaks down. And me and a couple lot of people just praying for, for people like that. Where people come into, and we are the ministers of God. That, that is what God wants you and I to be for the broken people out there that live in bondage. And it, sometimes it screams so loud, we don't even have to search it out. Those people are coming already because they come and like, I am bound. I don't know what it is, but I feel like there's voices speaking to me. I don't know what it is, but I feel like nothing's happening good in my life. Everything that I touch is somehow falling apart. Nothing good is happening and everything is just so bad. And my family relationships, everything is broken. People are coming in this way to you. They start speaking out. And what is your response? I have an appointment, i got to go, right? <laughs> no, what is our response to people like this? The anointing of the Lord is on us, that we should proclaim freedom to the captives. We should proclaim opening of dungeons, opening of prisons to the ones that are held. We can come alongside those people just like those priests and say, oh, I have good news for you. Jesus Christ is here right now and he wants to set you free. Whatever bondage there is on your life, whatever the, the enemy has devastated in your life, the Lord wants to redeem it. And he wants to set you free complete, completely. Let's get down on our knees. Let me put my arm around you. Let, let's get down on my knees and let's pray. Let's break the bondages of Satan over your life. And let's speak freedom into life. There is a ministry like this that the Lord has ordained over life. We'll never get there unless, just like Jim preached last week, un until we open up our, our, our hands, our eyes. We give, him, we give him our resources. We give him our time. We give him our talents. We surrender to God and give him all that. Now I've said all of this. I need to watch the time here a little bit. But let's go back to this story in Acts here. I wanted to go somewhere else first, but I'm a little bit short in time. But all of this to say <laughs> there was a natural problem in the early church, Acts chapter 6. But the, the, the apostle said, pick extraordinary people that are full with the anointing of God. People that are full with the Spirit of God. Because even when you do ordinary ministry, 
It takes the Spirit of God <laughs> to do something. And now let's look at the lives of what these dudes here accomplished. I mean, look, look here in, in Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, <laughs> and he was not a bodybuilder, he was not a weightlifter, okay? Full of grace and power, that he's talking about the power of God, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And some of them criticized him, and they were not happy about him. In, in verse 10, then it says, But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And they secret, secretly instigated a man who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. When, when the enemy cannot get you down because you give him so many resources and open doors, he will always try to bring other people and to bring false witnesses and to bring something that somehow discredits your ministry. Stephen somehow here, he was, he, the enemy tried to discredit his ministry. And it's amazing, this whole story is amazing. And they set a false witnesses um, who spoke that against him. Verse 14, they said, And we have heard him say that the Jesus of Nazareth, the person Jesus of Nazareth, will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Well, that's partially true, but it's only half of the truth because there was a much better truth that Jesus Christ was preaching that Stephen was preaching too, but they kind of they kind of carefully stayed away. And then comes Stephen, and so in chapter 7, and the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, <laughs> and Stephen goes, okay, it's my turn now. Let, let me talk. And so he goes all the way back through salvation history about what God did in Israel and how God took Israel. He delivered them out of Egypt because he had a call on their life. He wanted to have an anointing on their life. He wanted to, them to be a blessing to all the nations on, under the earth. And he took them and he worked with them. But even all the prophets that tried to speak correction, you killed them all. <laughs> Let, let's turn to chapter 7. Where is it? In verse 51, then he comes to his conclusion. Don't you like conclusions? He comes to his conclusion after all this, and he says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ear, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. Again, the anointed one. Whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Whom you received. You who received the law. <laughs> Just think about that. You who have the Bible. You don't even read your own Bibles that the anointed one was supposed to come. You who have your Bibles. Have as, as it was delivered by angels, you did not keep it. And then they stone him. And it says, full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God. When you walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, no matter what happens around you, no matter how dire circumstances look around you, you will always see heaven open. And you will see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God interceding for you and for your life. And he said, Behold, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they started stoning him at the feet of Saul. Another story that we're going to pick up a little bit later. And then Saul starts persecuting the church. But people, people came to faith even through this because this event, Stephen had a great ministry. And what the enemy tried to quench through his ministry, it led to chapter 8, where it says, Saul ravages, <laughs> not persecute, he ravages the churches. How devastating. A church filled with the Holy Spirit, a church that's just full of unity, a church where everything seems to go so well for the church, all of a the sudden there's somebody ravaging the churches, dragging people off to be in prison, and, but prison back then was not holding you for lifetime, prison was only holding you until execution, literally dragging people off to be killed. This is what scattered those people. And then another guy 
uh, another guy, Philip. He was another guy who was appointed here to wait at tables for normal, ordinary, for ordinary tasks. Extraordinary people were were um, picked out. Stephen was one of them. The other extraordinary person was Philip. <laughs> and it says in chapter 8, verse 4, And those who were scattered went about preaching the word, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now he's preaching in Samaria because they were all scattered. God pushed them out, right? And proclaim to them the Christ. And verse 7. For unclean spirits crying out with loud voices came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy. Do you hear the superlatives in what Luke is writing here? So there was much joy in that city. And then we have Simon the sorcerer, uh, Simon who, who wants to buy the gift of God. And then Paul and, and John, they come to Samaria because they, of the successful ministry of Philip. But they have not received this, <laughs> this overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit. They have come to believe uh, that was Philip's ministry. But then uh, Peter and John, they heard that they have believed. And I was like, but they need the Holy Spirit. They need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they're going down to Samaria, to the villages, and they're laying on of hands, and they're Pray kind of like the encounter weekend, right? They, they pray that the Holy Spirit will just come and quicken those souls and lift them up and empower them again, not to feel good, but for service and for ministry. And now Philip, all of a sudden, now says in, in verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise up and go uh, to the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Philip had a successful growing great ministry and the lord tells him i want you to go to a desert <laughs> i'm like why do you call me away from a successful ministry where everything goes well to go and go to a desert there's no there's coyotes out there there's nothing out there why do you send me there but he doesn't quarrel it's like filled with the holy spirit as this guy is he just steps out and he goes to that place and then he says and he rose and went <laughs> no not even an argument anything and then in verse 29, it says, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join the chariot. He's hearing a chariot, a dust cloud on the horizon coming by. And the Spirit tells him, Go over to that dust cloud. I, I want to do something through you. And, and Philip goes over. He runs. Uh, verse 30, So Philip ran to him, and he heard him reading Isaiah. Remember what I said, patterns of opportunity? Here, Philip hears something that God is already doing. Uh, he's, somebody's reading the Word of God. Somebody's reading Scripture. So he's joining what God is already doing. Here. And so Philip is asking a question, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I understand if I have nobody to guide me? So he joins him in the chair. He explains to him the gospel. He explains to him Jesus Christ. And he, the guy starts believing. He doesn't want to wait uh, until the next baptism day. He stops at the river and says, Baptize me right now. Is that all right with you? And he says, oh, by all means, let's dunk you. So they go down to the river. He baptizes them. They come out. And this is what I love about Philip. God doesn't waste time with Philip. You remember how the story goes? As he comes out of the water, verse 39, it says, And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. <laughs> verse 40, But Philip found himself in Azostus. <laughs> You know, God doesn't even waste time, man. You, you are filled with the Holy Spirit so much. I can work so well through you. You don't argue with me. You don't bigger back about anything. I can just tell you, go to the desert and you go. I tell you, go and turn the carrier and you go. Whatever I do, you're so valid. I can work so well with you. It flows so well. I don't want to waste any time. You know what? <laughs> and here he appears all of a sudden. Let's continue the ministry. See, this, I, I want to say this because the, the anointing of God is on us. The anointing of God wants each one of our lives not to live mere Christianity, but to live a life full of the Holy Spirit because God wants to, he wanted somebody to witness to the Ethiopian eunuch. He was in the service of the queen of Ethiopia. Bring the gospel back to a country you could otherwise never reach. I mean, God already was busy spreading the gospel from Jerusalem to Samaria. Ethiopia is so far away, 
But there was an opportunity and God wanted somebody to witness there. And so he's looking for those vessels that are suitable, vessels that he can easily work through. And I believe God should find those vessels in our congregation. Amen? In your personal life, in my life. That when you go to Walmart, gosh, Jenna went shopping yesterday to Walmart late night. Uh, uh, Liam's birthday is tomorrow. And so she did some midnight shopping there basically or at 10 o'clock at night. And just while she came back from Walmart, she says, man, oof. if you ever go at night to Walmart, it's like there's a lot of ministry that can be done there. Uh, uh, people, <laughs> everybody, yes, amen, right? Um, she actually, Jana came up with the idea, we should do some power evangelism, just go to Walmart, you know, <laughs> let's start a team that does power evangelism. Hey, can I pray for you? What's your life story? And then people would already start sharing about how everything is bad, how devastations happen in the life, how the enemy has just put them in chains. It was like, I have good news for you. <laughs> Let me just proclaim freedom over your life because there is something, you know, when the anointing of the Lord is on your life, he will use you wherever you are and he will direct you wherever he wants you to be but we need to be those suitable vessels in his hands amen amen, amen. let's stand up let's let's pray here together it's already late but carry this in your heart as you go into your week if there is anything that hinders you from ministry uh if the altar team if if you guys that i've asked uh, would you guys come forward we just want to offer prayer again. If you don't want to rush out here right now, if you want to come and stay here a little bit longer, have our altar team pray for you. Have them set, proclaim freedom in your life over certain areas. Don't walk away and think maybe it will solve itself by itself. Just give people of full with the Holy Spirit, people of faith, the opportunity to speak freedom over your life. Amen. Father, we thank you for this church service today. We thank you for your glory, Father. We thank you for the word that you want to anoint our lives. You want to have powerful witnesses at your disposal, Father. You want to use us, Father, in a broken world, in a broken society, especially now in this dark week coming up, Father. You want, to, you want us to be the light, the light in darkness. We ask for a fresh anointing, Father, this morning. I pray for every congregation member that is here or that's maybe watching online, Father. We pray for every person that is surrendering their hearts. Would you fill us with your Holy Spirit? Would you fill us with your anointing so that we can be usable in your hands? We pray this in faith, Father, in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.